Good morning. I would like to start by inviting you back to the spring of 2012. I think it's, it's probably late March. I was on my way from New York to Damascus. I just spent 10 days in Damascus negotiating an understanding between the regime in Damascus and various rebel groups. Travel to New York, been in a flurry of meetings, seen about 2,564 PowerPoint slides, and been challenged on how many of the 1,365 pages about Syria and the mission and what we were trying to do, the content of these. Then, leaving New York, the Security Council, I went to Geneva and met the guy who was going to be the link to the political level outside and to New York while I was doing the job on the ground in Syria, Kofi Annan. So he said, good afternoon, do you want coffee or do you want tea? And a photo opportunity, as always, with these guys. And then we sat down at a little round table. And in the next about 10 minutes, he, as the leader, gave me the aim, the direction, and everything I needed to know about what I was going to try to achieve in Syria. He sat me down and said, Robert, in a couple of weeks, we need to have contact with the rebels and with the government, the politicians and the general, and have a dialogue with them on how we can move this situation out of this deadlock. I'll give you 300 people. Money is not an issue. We'll try to get you the equipment, and you will not be allowed to carry arms, as said by the Security Council. And whatever you do, whatever you do, you will relate to the rebel groups outside government control all over Syria. And whatever you do, you will not become the enemy of the regime. In a few minutes, he gave me, let's say, the frame, the time, resources, people, money, equipment. He gave me what he wanted to achieve. And he gave me a couple of, whatever you do, you will do this. And whatever you do, you will not do this. And as a leader, that is exactly what you are expected to do, and exactly what you need to do if you want to succeed with whatever results you're trying to create, with whatever mission you're on. Then, when you set out to achieve the mission, you will meet your bear. Not that kind of bear, but the kind of bear with four legs in this picture. I've met mine on several occasions, but Freddy, a fishing and hunting comrade of mine, he tells the story of when he met his bear, a real four-legged one. And we were on different tracks. He was running hotels. I was doing the military stuff and working for the UN. And at that point, I also had already several trips to Afghanistan with what we have been doing there. So he tells me about the time when he came out on a little opening in the Pasvik Valley, east of Kirkenes, and he sees the bear at the other end of this little opening. 
And for whatever reason, he didn't understand it from the beginning. The bear came at him. And some of you might have experienced this, others might have seen it on television, but when a bear comes at you, it's with four-wheel drive and lots of power, and the back of the hair on the back of the, the bear is really flurry to make it seem even bigger and scarier than it is. Now, the way Freddy describes it, the bear stops eight to ten meters in front of him, looks at him, and then slowly retreats. But then she comes again, a second time, full speed, all-wheel drive, the water and the, the grass and, and the, let's say the Things from the ground are spinning up in the air, and now she stops a couple of meters closer. And my friend Freddy, he was a quite calm guy. He is now turning red on his, his uh, the side of his, his neck, and he is starting to sweat. Even several years later, when he is telling this story, because he tells it at some point every time we get together. <laughs> and then the bear retreats again. And then he sees there is a movement in the brushes behind the bear on two places. So he understands that he is in a situation that you rather would not be in. He has met Mama Bear, and she has got two cubs, fortunately behind her, not between him and her. But anyway, she starts to look a little bit uh, grumpy again, and here we go, full speed ahead, four-wheel drive, really noise and scary, and now Freddy says he stops, she stops at only eight meters. And at this time, he has decided it's not enough to simply stand my ground, because that had been his decision up until now. So he decides, I have to scream. So he delivers one of these screams that you might have exercised on the kind of seminars where you're supposed to get in contact with your real inner self. <laughs> Um, it works on Mama Bear, uh, so it stops at, at eight meters. And then she starts to wag a little bit, her, little bit with her head, and he decides, well, I can't just stand here if this is going to continue. So after the scream, he started to wag a little bit himself, and then one step back, the bear one step back, he one step back. And then eventually he turns, she turns, and they go separate ways. It ended well. But his point with that story is a story, is a point that is valid to all leaders at all levels. Because he says, I remember this is, this is the hotel owner talking to the guy who is traveling the world and trying to make some kind of contribution, and he says, Robert, what Whatever you do in these countries, in these missions, all you have to remember is that you need to look the challenge directly in the eyes and stand your ground. You need to remember as a leader there are, must be no elephants in the room when you're in a challenging transition or when you're on a crisis mission. There cannot be issues, there cannot be topics that you leave in the corner that should be spoken about, but you leave them there. Maybe because you have a leadership group, a group of people that are more fond of saying, yes, Robert, you're a smart guy, than saying, Robert, this is absolutely not the way we should do it. It's a valid point. I will take you from this eloquent, extremely convincing, subtle way of an experienced leader to give me the mission in a few minutes and motivate me, energize me to go there and really try to get the job done. And this topic of seeing the challenge directly, meeting it head on, to some leadership keywords. I will talk about responsibility, integrity, mission focus, 
and caring. Leadership is about responsibility. My first mission as the leader of 10 to 15 people, I was supposed to blow up a bridge with explosives many, many years ago. The Soviet Union, the Cold War, the front line of the Cold War. We had 211 minutes to get this bridge blown because after 211 minutes, the Soviet airborne forces would be behind us and the tanks would be in front of us. That was the planning basis. I did everything wrong. I had not prepared myself well enough. I had not checked the evening before whether the um, fuel tanks had been refilled. I had not check the keys in the small locker and the code combination to get there, to get to the live explosives and ammunition and so on and so forth. I did not have uh, full control of the people. So some of them were where they were not supposed to be, in this case in Tromsø, having a good time, more or less well deserved. So when the exercise bell rang at three o'clock in the morning, everything went wrong. And it was my mistake, it was my mess up, Nobody else. But then, when we had the gathering with the commander at the next level, and the whole group, we were waiting, you know, we were waiting, humbled, for the disaster to really make us blush, and to really make us feel small. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. The leader at the next level, he stood there in front of the big boss and said, I have not prepared well enough for this. I have not checked the keys. I have not made sure we have trained well enough. This was my mistake. It will not happen again. And I'm sorry. It was accepted. And those of us sitting in the front row, listening to this guy, carrying the weight of the responsibility on his shoulders entirely. You all know what happened to us. We were motivated, we were inspired, and we decided never ever again were we going to do such a stupid mistake. We would be prepared the next time. So leadership is responsibility in the sense that you need to carry it all the time. It is not something you can choose to carry in a situation or choose not to carry. It is yours, you own it, and you need to deal with your unit as if and live by the rule as if it is the, it is the team that creates successes. And when it's a mistake, when it's a disaster, it's your responsibility. Leadership is responsibility, carrying it all the time. My second point is that leadership is integrity. We know it, all of us. You know, the temptation to exploit certain freedoms because you're at a certain level. The um, temptation I saw among my leadership group in Kosovo, when the young soldiers' conscripts on contract were living out in the cold Balkan autumn. It was rainy, it was cold, it was foggy, it was the, from the brown coal factories, the dust on the windscreens in the morning. And they were digging holes in the ground because in this mission it was expected that we might see a Serbian counterattack on the forces that were now protecting Kosovo. And then they decided, while I was away, that they, they didn't like to have the black boots on that went high on the legs. It was humid, it was warm, it was not very comfortable inside the containers with the heater that the staff was located in. So when the young soldiers then came from the field, wet, dirty, tired, hungry, to have support and help and assistance and inspiration from this leadership team. 
What do you think happened when the leadership team came there with, they had bought some small sandals, so they came out and met these soldiers warm, dry, and with yellow and green and pink sandals on their feet. They had credibility in, in exactly one minute. Then it was gone. Whether it's about leaving a note on the car that you scratch in, in the parking house, whether it's not allowing yourself freedoms that you cannot give to your people, leadership is integrity and it starts with you. Leadership is mission focus, is my third point. I'm going to invite you to Homs. We're back in Syria now, inside Syria. It's a small village. We are there with the direction and the mission understanding communicated by Kofi Annan. We're going into Homs to get them contact with the rebels inside Homs so that we can speak to both sides, not only the government and the generals in Damascus, but also the rebel groups outside government-controlled areas. So we are two cars, eight people unarmed. We stop at the front line with the tanks and say we're, we're now moving into Homs to meet the rebels. And they had to make some phone calls and then they allowed us over. We drive in through streets where it's already most houses are bombed out, there's not a cat to see, not a human being to see, and then we come a little bit further in, protected from the sights of the snipers and, and the tanks on the other side. There's a group of two to three hundred people in a square, and meeting us. We leave the cars and we start to, to find, find a way to get in contact with the rebels. Now, long story short, at this point, after a couple of minutes, one of the locals are shot through the head, standing next to one of my observers. And this was a Scandinavian observer who was in a dramatic mission for the first time in his life. So obviously, like it would have done on any of us, but on him in particular, it made an impression. It made a strong impression. So he came back to me, to the car, and said, this is too dangerous, we have to turn around, we cannot go through with this. And at this point, since a sniper had opened up, it was a very loud and um, tense situation among this group of two to three hundred people in the, in the square. But then came the Moroccan, and then came the Egyptian, and then came the J Jordanian, because I'd had the opportunity with Kofi Annan to put together a team of people with exactly the local knowledge of culture, religion, and family ties, and business, and tribal connections in that area, so that could give me the kind of advice I needed. And I said, no, they said, this is absolutely not the time to turn around. This is the time to stand firm. If someone had wanted to kill you guys, they would have done it a long time ago. I, I know it sounds cocky when I say it like that, but it's not meant cocky, it's simply a statement of the fact, because we were two cars, eight people, unarmed, in an environment where that would have been easy. And that was their argument. They said, this is simply someone trying to test you whether you have the nerve, whether you have the nerve to stand in the situation with the Syrians. If you leave now, you have lost the mission. You can go by Geneva and back to New York. You will not meet anyone of the rebels in any of the other villages. If you go through with it, you will gain respect, you will gain access, and you will have a real dialogue. I had served in the Middle East before in also slightly dramatic situations, so it was not that hard for me to take that recommendation instead of the recommendation of the guy who was a first-timer. So we went through with it, we had a meeting in the bottom of the outbound mosque, and it gave us access the coming weeks to rebels in Aleppo, in Deir Ezzor, in many, many parts of Syria. What, what is this point? It's mission focus. When you're there, when it's a current problem, don't look back, 
only look forward, no regrets, all the energy we're using on regretting a decision or doubting or all of that is, is a diversion. But there's another message, and that is when you put together your team, you need to make it as complementary as possible. If you have same age, same sex, same background, same education, and lots of other factors, it will be the lousiest leadership group you've ever seen. If you put it together to be complementary in opinion, in background, in age, in sex, in all of it, and create an atmosphere in the leadership group where it's their job to argue against any decision until we're happy that we have the right one, you can truly move, move mountains with such a leadership group and create tremendous results. But there's also a third message in that study, and that is every company, every organization, every situation, every village has its context, whether it's customers, whether it's rebels, whether it's the Assad family, and if you don't understand that concept, it is so easy to slip into the simple solution immediately in front of your eyes, but that is not the solution that will keep you focused on the mission and achieving results. So you need also to know the context. My last point, after having made argued that leadership is responsibility, integrity, and mission focus, is that leadership is also caring. Caring about people. My first battalion commander up in, up in the high north, his name was Sigurd Frisvold. He's now retired and he lives in Kristiansund, not that far away. He was a tough leader. But one, one situation that turned, taught me this point is one in particular that I'd like to share with you. And that is, there were no mobile phones at that time. We didn't have skidoos. We didn't have helicopters, for that matter. So we were simply skiing through the mountains with wooden skis and a big rucksack and a big sledge behind us. And we had been doing that for several days. And that day, it was minus 15, we had started early in the morning. Been working our way through the, the hillsides with birches and ups and downs and ups and downs. And then at 10, 11 o'clock in the evening, we had put our tents up inside the birch wood. And we were enormously tired. And as usual, the horses, because we had a horse unit at that time that were supposed to bring us food, the horse unit was still seven hours delayed, so the dinner would arrive at 2 a.m. in the morning. But anyway, we, the big hole in the snow, because that's where you gather the cold and sleeping bags and a little bit of heat on the, on the small burner, and we were starting to drowse off to have a few hours of sleep before we were going to do this all over again. Then we heard some noise outside the tent. And there comes a big figure opening the buttons, going down into this hole in the snow, and there you have seven sleepy, half-awake, terribly tired soldiers in front, of, in front of his eyes. And he asks us in the Trunder dialect, um, very characteristically, uh, whether we are okay, whether we are tired, have you had something to eat, have you had something to drink? And then he asked to see our toes. So all the, all the feet out of the sleeping bags, toes in the open, and he touched all the feet and checked. He was checking for frostbite, because if you have a serious frostbite on, on your toes, you might lose a toe, actually. And that was not the point, it's a, it's a fairly benign point, but what he demonstrated to us, because it was not one tent, it was 35, 40 tents. So after having worked all day in his context with his leadership, he spent 
half of his sleeping time going into each of these tents and demonstrating to his team that I care about you. And he asked us how we had experienced the day. And when he left, of course, it was with the demand. At 5 o'clock tomorrow, we're going forward. He taught me something that I've carried with me and that, more importantly, I've seen with successful units all over the world. If you combine caring for people with demands, you establish a ladder on which they will climb. They will climb the ladder. They will be inspired. They will try to climb the ladder. They will feel the energy once they've made the first step. And then, with a little bit tougher demands, they will go for the next one. And that one, for me, is relevant in all leadership issues. So, responsibility, integrity, mission focus, caring and demands is, uh, for me, key words on leadership. How do you prepare yourselves to move towards a conclusion? How do you prepare yourselves as leaders, as teams? I've met in many, many units, in many organizations, leaders and junior leaders who say that this is the way we do it on a daily basis. But if we experience a crisis, or if there's going to be a big transition, we'll do it like this. A late evening at 10 o'clock, 35 years ago, a UN patrol was walking a small pathway down to a village, towards the village in, in Lebanon. Eight people. They had a armored car in behind them, and a UN flag, and a, and a big light. Then they were ambushed from a turn in the road, about 150 meters in front of them. There was a well-prepared ambush set up. They opened fire, Hezbollah, we believe, with a machine gun, with uh, AK-47 rifles, and with anti-tank weapons. And then, what happens? What happens is that the patrol, they go down on their knee, and then they observe to see where the fire is coming from. Because we spent every training period when we had the soldiers at that time in the Norwegian system coming back for extra training, we taught them back home in Norway that if you are fired upon, you go down on your knee and you observe to see where the shots are coming from. Does it work? Obviously not. So we lost one of ours that dark, rainy night. And this is at the beginning of my work, but that taught me a couple of crucial issues that I believe I will invite you to reflect upon also. You will act in a crisis exactly the way you act in your daily work. In the military language, you fight as you train. It's a terrible feeling in your stomach when the crisis is there, when you see that something is going wrong and you realize that we're conducting ourselves exactly in the same way as we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and in a crisis, in a huge rapid transition, in, in that kind of situation, it doesn't work. So, whatever we do, we should remember that we will act in a crisis, the team will relate to each other in a crisis. The systems will be worked in a crisis exactly in the way we have trained. 
And then we're moving on from responsibility, integrity, mission, focus, and caring combined with demand. I would also make the argument that, uh, that one of the most effective mechanisms I have seen in any success unit abroad is to use bottom-up value process as a way to create a team that can walk through fire, achieve anything. We spent two and a half years in, in the special forces system of Norway and with, the, with the, some of the units that was in tougher operations between 2000 and 2006, establishing common values bottom up. Not hiring in some commercial firm and having them define a slogan or having them find some good values that we then could decide the, in the leadership team and push down the organization but starting at the bottom, asking those doing the job, what is it that makes you pull the trigger or not pull the trigger? What makes you proud? What values will you live by when you have a prisoner, when you have an enemy wounded in front of you, and so on and so forth? What values will you live by when you come to, to a village far behind enemy lines in Afghanistan and realize that something is terribly wrong? It's not necessarily your job to do something about it, because you're supposed to do something else. What will you choose? Well, they defined respect, responsibility, and courage as the values that they wanted to live by. But that's not the real point. The point is that if you want a really powerful organization, you need to establish common values, bottom-up, that are owned by the whole organization. And lastly, I was um, privileged to have a couple of years with the UN, UN, U.S. Marine Corps in, in the U.S. some years ago. And some of the professors, they asked us, uh, in fact, rather rhetorically in the beginning, and these, we were then junior leaders, they asked us, how many of you have sat down, thought through, and formulated your leadership concept? I have been told that there's lots of leaders in the audience. I ask you the same question. How many of you have sat down, and in one, maximum two pages, formulated your leadership concept. The professors at the university we were attending, they said, okay, fine, we will spend two weeks doing this. You will sit down. It's not allowed to use slogans from books. It's not allowed to use lists from some, some other book or video with someone tell, saying that this and this and this and this is what you need to do to be a good leader. It's going to be your concept in your words, nothing else. And when you're finished, you're going to convince the rest of us that it's your concept and that it will work. Fantastic exercise. To go inside yourself, search deep, Use the time to formulate your leadership concept for yourself, maybe share it with others. It's a tremendous learning experience. I will conclude with my nine-year-old son who gave me a leadership advice a couple of days ago, actually a couple of weeks ago. He uh, came home from school. He was, you know, like eight, nine years old can be when they come home and they're, they're, they, they believe that they have learned something, ex, ex, found out something really exciting, big eyes and proud and eager to speak. So he said, Dad, Dad, why do we have two ears and one mouth? Yeah, you know, there's a little thing from mommy and a little thing from me and there's a baby and we all have 
two arms and two legs and two ears and a mouth. I suppose that's the way we're made. I, no, wrong answer. That's not why. And then, of course, I made, uh, I made myself difficult because I, I think I understood <laughs> where we were going. And then with the energy of the eight, nine-year-old, it comes, Dad, it's because you're going to listen twice as much as you're going to talk. <laughs> and that's a good leadership advice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. It was really, um, I don't know, the, the, I'm looking for a word, actually. It was like, we were a bit of a rock standing there, by the way, just sort of boom. I feel safe in your hands, don't we? Yeah. Loads of questions coming in. I don't know if we've got time to ask all of them. Loads of questions coming in. Um, I think I'll start with this one, actually, which I thought was really interesting. This one comes from Sally. What is a leadership skill that you, you are still working on? You. Which of those leadership skills are you working on the most? The most in right now is trying to get to know myself even better. Um, I have a job doing partly these and other things, but I'm also a volunteer, uh, a board president of the Norwegian Red Cross. And with different organizations, with different backgrounds and values and all of that, it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer for me that you need to know yourself. Mm. And I see myself as a soft, romantic, caring figure. I feel the love. I feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I have been told, and I have slowly but slowly understood that sometimes I can come across differently. <laughs> right now, right now you're my bear, okay, so I'm standing my ground. So, no, but you... so getting, digging inside myself and, and really trying to think in this situation with this group when I go on a winter exercise in, in the mountains of Norway, meeting the police, volunteers from uh, the west coast of Norway and other locals and how how will I avoid being taken as a, a general who is coming to tell them what to do instead yeah. of someone who is inviting reflection and yeah. inspiring and all of that? So, Another question here. Um, questions like, how do you keep calm in such extreme situations? Uh, I guess experience and training, you mentioned that. Um, you, you talk a lot about this responsibility, mission focus, integrity, looking the bear in the eyes, caring for others. What do you think of politicians? Hmm. Was that on this one? No, I mean, no, 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 no. That's from me, yeah? I have a we huge, haven't got that much time. I have a huge yeah. respect for politicians. There's a, politics is by different rules. But yeah. if we go to the Norwegian context, I'm tempted to say that uh, we need to understand that political dynamics, political arguments is different from substance and fact and what we need to work with. When I visit and discuss with uh, police chiefs, with uh, health service chiefs, with other in the public service of Norway, they are, many of them are frustrated because they, they think that they are not getting through with, with their Mm. Uh, arguments based on their trade. Mm. Uh, but you shouldn't be frustrated by that. Political logic is to try to tell a lie without being caught in a lie when you believe that that is going to give you more votes. And we should respect that. Mm. That's the way it is. Mm. But if we use, for example, new public management in, in, in a very destructive way from the top and take the directly the political logic and push that down through to those who are going to do the job based on a trade, the police, mm. the health workers and all the rest of it, it's destructive. So right, we need they to are, they are in translate. the front line, they are the guys dealing with the facts, everyday exactly. facts, that's what you're saying. How often have you heard 
Norwegians or Norwegian politicians say Norway is the richest country in the world. Yeah, I don't believe You never that, heard it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know what number we are? 29. I know all this. You don't need to tell. You're, yeah, you're, you're exactly. talking, you're preaching to 29. the converted. Yes, I know. And how many times <laughs> have we heard, I'll talk to you instead then, yeah. how, many, how, many, <laughs> how many times have you heard politicians say Norway is a small country? It's, 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 it's like an, uh, an elephant that we have expect, uh, accepted, all of us, and it's used as a political term when you want to excuse that you're not taking on the leadership in the world that you could have taken in, on the climate issue, in the UN, in different contexts. It's used kind of an, an excuse. Now we're a small country, but we're not a small country. We're one of the biggest countries in the world. We have the second largest coastline in the world. We have an oil and gas industry from this city down to where I were yesterday in Bømlo and Stavanger. That's exporting one third of the energy supply to the UK. We're a huge country, strategically in a vulnerable place. Again, dealing with the facts. Get rid of the elephants. Leave it to the politicians. Robert. <laughs> um, on a personal note, I was, I was really moved by your talk. I was really moved by it. The message I take away, perhaps some others share this with me, you said, caring plus demands gives people a ladder to climb up, yeah. and they usually climb. Yeah. We thank you for your work and your contribution of you and all the men and women working with you. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining us. Thank, thank you. Great. Fantastic. Uh, we've gone a little bit over time, but I felt we, you know, needed to ask those questions there. We're going to have a lovely lunch now. Uh, one thing before you go to lunch, when you go to lunch outside, there are some young chess players out on the grass, about eight of them, from the local Allasun Chess Club. They're going to be sitting at tables. If you fancy taking them on, take them on. <laughs> we'll see you back here. Listen for the bell. We'll be back here around one o'clock. We start up again. Listen for the bell to call you back in. Have a lovely lunch. Ding, ding, like glittering gold. I got fire in my soul.